Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, th these two books uh, the, uh, were written in 2014. Uh, one book on the oil curse and the other on uh, transition. Now, since 2014, first, oil prices have dropped by half, and they're likely to stay that way. And the transition has basically gone in several different directions, including backwards. So my working title for this session is, what transition, what resource curse? Right? Uh, and uh, it's, it's a little unfair because this book was written, uh, now I'm going to turn to the transition book, uh, was written in 2014, 15. But really, I mean, quite seriously, today, if you look at the MENA region, um, what, what are the big issues? We're faced with low oil prices, as Ahmed uh, suggested earlier. Uh, we're faced with terrorism, and in particular Daesh, which is having an impact throughout the, the countries of the region. And then three or four of our countries are in a full-blown civil war. Right? This, is a, this is not a smooth transition. Uh, now, in particular, the, the, to be fair, the book anticipates some of it, particularly the, the chapter by Mustafa Nabli about what it takes for a democratic transition to, to take place, including state capacity um, and, the, and the paper by Melanie Kamet about dep it depends critically on which way the elites uh, align themselves for a transition to, uh, to take place. But most of the book, most of the transition book, is really about the causes of the Arab Spring and the, and the transition. And it does a very good job there. So let me just, again, I, uh, just highlight the, f the four. I also have four categories of the, uh, of the clues, uh, but uh, it's slightly different from uh, what Ahmed uh, just uh, suggested. And then let's see whether we can use some of the insights from those clues as to, uh, to tell us what to do going forward. Because we've got a, a very big challenge going forward with all of these problems in the region. So the first is I would combine the politics and economics, as you said in your exposition, into one. And I think this, the, this idea of the old social contract that is broken is a way of combining the two. Because the social contract is really both about economic policy and it's about politics. It's about the relationship between the state and, and the citizens. And this old social contract that was remarkably similar across the Arab world was one where the state provided uh, free health and education, subsidized food and fuel, and public sector jobs. And in return for which, the population, so as not to risk the largesse of the state, uh, kept their voices low. And that was the authoritarian bargain that, that uh, Ahmed uh, alluded to. Now, the problem was that this was not sustainable, in particular that public sector jobs, because the state couldn't afford it. The, the fiscal deficits were getting too big, and they had to, had to stop. But the, the, the real problem was that the private sector, particularly the formal private sector, didn't grow fast enough in order to absorb all the young people in the jobs. And that's what led to the, the highest unemployment rate in the world, the highest youth unemployment rate in the world as well, which is double the average unemployment rate. And then the whole thing blew up. Uh, and th 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 so this, this, is the, this is the cause, the underlying cause, that the one side of the social contract was broken, so the other side had to, had to be broken as well. So going forward, well, okay, let me, let me then mention the three other topics and then I'll talk about how to go forward. So the second is the, uh, the, the issue of inequality. And I think it's very important to keep in mind, it's about perceptions of inequality. It is that notion of social justice. It's not actual inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient, but it is the perception. And it is, it is interesting, and this point about the middle class, because while most of these indicators during the 2000s were improving, like you know, growth was uh, increasing, poverty was falling, inequality was declining, the life satisfaction ind index in the MENA region was plummeting. MENA was the unhappiest region in the world, right? including in countries like Tunisia, where all the other indicators were, were, were growing. Now, this is before the Arab Spring. But the other fact, which isn't highlighted, is that if you compare the life satisfaction of the bottom 40% to the top 60% of the population, it was the top 60% that was falling faster. 
This is the only region in the world where it was that way. Usually, you think the poor, the bottom 40% is unhappier than the top 60%. But here, and that's what's a reflection of this middle class, that, that included in the top 60% are the people from, say, the 40th to the 80th percentile, who are the middle class, and it was their frustration with uh, the lack of jobs and the poor public services and so on. The third is the rentier states, but here I want to extend it, because when we say rentier states, most people think, oh, well, that's just the oil countries. No. In MENA, even the oil importing countries are rentier states. Uh, and there's a, there's a nice cha chapter by Adil Malik talking about the role of aid. Aid is another source of rent. And I think the country we are sitting in right now is exhibit A of how to be an oil-rich country without oil. Right? J Jordan has no oil, uh, and yet it basically relies on remittances and aid, which is coming either from the Gulf or from, uh, from the Western countries, because of its geostrategic rent. Jordan is a, is, a, is a place of stability, and it earns a rent from, from its location. And that, w in, in many ways, Jordan looks just like the oil-rich countries. Uh, and, <laughs> right? and you see that when the price of oil goes down, not only do, do the oil country's uh, GDP go down, but Jordan's GDP goes down too. Uh, because it relies so much on oil-related uh, uh, revenues. And then finally, the fourth factor, which Ahmed didn't talk about too much, um, but I think is actually very interesting in the book, is the role of external factors. Uh, and there are several chapters in the book that first talk about global economic conditions. So when you do, you know, you do trade liberalization at a time when the world economy is in a, in a recession, that really ch changes the perception of trade liberalization. Even if it was a good thing to do, if you see the economy come sliding down, you, you associate that with trade liberalization. But it's, it's actually more than that, because as we were saying earlier, there, there's also the, 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 the role of uh, 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 external actors in providing aid, and then that aid can, be, uh, can go up or down. Okay, so given these four f features, the social contract, inequality, perception, rentier states, and external factors, and given the problem we have, which is coping with low oil prices, coping with, uh, with uh, Daesh uh, and, and, and terrorism and uh, civil wars, how can we use this book? How can we build on the lessons from this book to figure out a way of going forward? So I think the, 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 the this metaphor of the social contract is extremely useful because it does tell us, it gives us clues as to what should the new social contract look like. Because a new social contract has to be based on private sector growth. It cannot go back to the old social contract where employment was based in the public sector. But how do you get that private sector growth? And that's where you come to the, the cronyism, right? The cronyism was a way, we, we created monopoly rents in the countries which was a way of impeding the small and medium enterprises from growing and creating jobs. Right? So if you want to get to the new social contract, we have to do something about the monopolies and the oligopolies in our countries, which takes us to competition policy. So this has suddenly become, I mean, competition policy has, has become agenda item number one. It's not like you know, one of 10 things to do uh, uh, on a good day. I mean, every, every finance minister in the region comes to see me and says, help me with the unemployment problem in my country. And I say, okay, you help me with your cronyism problem, because these are just two sides of the same coin. So there might be a way to, to make some progress there. Um, secondly, the, I think on the, uh, the, the other side is, the one good thing coming out of the low oil prices today is that across the board, countries are cutting their energy subsidies. Uh, the Gulf countries, to Morocco, Egypt, uh, and uh, Jordan, and, and so on. Now, the energy subsidy was also a, an example of a flawed social contract, in addition to creating all sorts of distortions and everything else. Because what it tells you is, when, if you're a poor person, what, it, what an energy or fuel subsidy says is, if you want to get a benefit from the state, you have to consume fuel. The state is controlling you as to how to get the benefit. Now compare that to a, a fiscal transfer, a pure cash transfer, where the state gives you a transfer if you're poor, 
and you can spend it on whatever you like. That changes the, the contract. Now the poor person actually has more agency in deciding how to spend money. So the, the shift from energy subsidies to, to, to transfer payments is actually part of the new social contract. And we might be making some progress there. Three yes. Yes, only two more points. <laughs> okay, um, and then let me turn to this perceptions of inequality uh, and the middle and the middle class. That is actually gives us a clue as to what to do, one thing to do about Daesh. I mean, there's not no way that we economists can handle the whole problem of of uh, terrorism, but we we have done some work where you try to look at what are the predictors of people going off to fight for Daesh, and it turns out. It's not poverty, uh, it's not income, it's not even education, but it's highly correlated with the male unemployment rate. Right? So again, the, if you're a male and you're unemployed in many of these countries, you have a, a feeling of social exclusion, which then Daesh offers as an alternative, and you get on a plane and go and fight in Raqqa or, or, or wherever. And finally, on the civil wars, um, there's some interesting work that's been done in my, in my office about the, uh, well, one of the things we're trying to find is can ethnic fragmentation predict civil wars or conflict? And it turns out by themselves, ethnic uh, polarization or religious polarization doesn't predict civil wars uh, or, or conflict unless you add another variable, which is an external military intervention. Then all of a sudden, and it's particularly strong in the Middle East, then ethnic polarization does have an effect on, on conflict. So this tells us that these external factors can be extremely important in polarized and divided uh, societies. And then finally, what can we do about civil wars? Uh, most of our civil wars are really proxy wars, right? There are other countries outside of the fighting country that are involved, that are financing, that are sending arms to the, to the civil war. Now, how, what can we do about that? Well, I think this conference and the theme of this conference is one way that we as economists can help to bring about some kind of solution, which is getting countries to cooperate with each other as a way of building trust, getting them to cooperate economically with each other on trade and infrastructure and, and things like that as a way of building trust so that then they might be able to cooperate on civil war or bringing down the, the level of conflict in the region.